This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mary Ann Fox. I'm the chancellor here at the University of California, San Diego. We'd like to welcome you to our campus and to this new beautiful venue, the Scripps Seaside Forum for Science, Society, and the Environment. We're delighted that you're visiting the University of California at San Diego because we have a very important role with, with respect to the city and to California. This is an institution of some 28,000 students those students have, over the, the last years of its existence, which will be 50 in two years, uh, have contributed significantly to the economic well-being of the state, the region, and the nation. We contribute about $8 billion worth of uh, value to the California economy, of the intellectual property generated at the University of California. About 200 businesses have been started. We estimate that direct jobs created by this university count for about four. 400,000 people in the, in the state. So we're delighted to share some of our experience with you and thank you sincerely for coming to San Diego to do so. Let me comment about this facility. The first thing I should mention to you, especially given the budget situation in California, is this was entirely funded by, public, by private money. <laughs> <laughs> and as you see, uh, it's a very versatile facility. It's one that uh, connects very strongly with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and with our number one in the nation surfing uh, beach right <laughs> in our, on our campus. So uh, I, we welcome you here. We've only been open at this facility for about a month. So you're pioneers in that way. This facility was designed for gather, gatherings like this in mind. We hope to bring the brightest minds together in this facility to tackle some of the great scientific challenges of our day. The type of collaboration translates ideas and discoveries into applications that make a difference in people's lives. So we're very pleased that your group, CEOs for Cities, has chosen this location to send a very important message. The theme of the meeting, the up upside of down, how to keep our cities great, is really timely for San Diego and for California. We faced uh, severe state budget cuts, soaring unemployment, we're individually looking at research groups on this campus and thinking how to make them more efficient in the conduct of their business, which is teaching research and service to the state. But we must find new ways to innovate and to find the upside of this down economy. In fact, there has never been a need greater for innovative city leaders and innovative research universities to come together in a very positive way. So today, during the discussions, you'll have an opportunity to explore new leadership models, new ways for the city to innovate and emerge from these hard financial times. And you'll hear two mayors who have catapulted their cities to international acclaim. So before the discussion begins, I'd like to offer a special welcome to our two distinguished guests on the, the dais here, Chicago Mayor Richard Daley and former Bogota Mayor Enrique Peñalosa, as well as our own mayor, the Honorable Jerry Sanders. So I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Helen Edison Lecture Series, and our Extension Division, who made all of the hard work that went into organizing such a conference. And uh, thank you so much for putting this event together and for coming to San Diego. Now it's my pleasure to invite Mayor Jerry, Jerry Sanders to say a few words. Thank Jerry. You. Thank you. Chancellor, thank you very much. And uh, as I stand here today, uh, I am very excited that uh, we have Mayor Daly and Mayor Penalosa here. Uh, but I'm even more excited about uh, the subject that's being spoken about, and that's uh, providing an upside in a down economy. And I think that uh, that's one of the things that we have uh, grappled with. And uh, I know that, uh, fortunately, you've been filmed and you'll be on TV, so we get to watch that. Our staff gets to watch it, and we get to uh, call all those ideas, which is going to be a tremendous thing for us. 
Uh, really, we see our relationship with UCSD and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography and San Diego State and many of the other institutions as being the upside of a down economy. Uh, we see that energy uh, that's formed when groups come together. Uh, and what we've seen in San Diego over the past 20 years is now paying dividends during the down economy. Uh, and that's as we start to move into the new clean tech clusters. Uh, and we brought uh, 50 business leaders together and we've had uh, two sessions, our third one's early next month. And one of the, the four uh, ideas that came out of that, the four guiding principles that we'll be moving on is creating a clean tech uh, cluster in San Diego, much like biotech, high tech, uh, the life sciences, all of those that have thrived around the university. Uh, and the byproducts of the research of all of these different disciplines are now creating a brand new cluster of business that's growing every single day. Uh, growing from zero to about 175 new businesses uh, specifically around UCSD using the research uh, in the new clean tech area. So I want to thank Chancellor Fox. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Tony Hammett is here. I know you're here somewhere. And most of all, I want to thank Scott Peters, Secretary Tracy. <laughs> because I wouldn't be here today if she hadn't called and demanded I be here. And Tracy's <laughs> one of my favorite people in the entire world. So, I, uh, This is, uh, once again, a tremendous opportunity for us to host CEOs for Cities and get some great input and learn some real lessons from people who uh, have made big change in their cities and have come together and met and talked about those changes and now we can profit from that experience. And I just want to welcome you and thank you and I know today's your last day and I uh, hope you've had a great time in San Diego and we'd certainly love to host you into the future. So thank you very much and Chancellor, thank you very much. I'd now like to turn the program over to a very important guest, the Director of CEOs for Cities, uh, Carol Coletta. Carol. Thank you. Thanks, Chancellor. Uh, it, it is good to be with you today in this gorgeous facility. Um, I think the, the partnership spoken of just now between the university and the city and the uh, city's business community is an important one that CEOs has embodied from its beginnings in terms of its cross-sector nature. And as the mayor said, I can't think of two better people for us to learn from today than, um, than our guest that we have with us, uh, whom we're going to be able to talk with informally uh, in a Q&A. So this should be a, a fun, informal format uh, for us all to learn from. Let me introduce them to you, although I'm sure in, in many ways neither of them needs an introduction. But uh, Mayor Daley was first elected mayor of Chicago in April uh, eight, 19, not 18, that's bad. <laughs> you, he's been mayor a long time, yeah, but not that I long. very well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 1989. I'll never live that down now. I have to live there. Um, but, but he is, as you all know, he's been nationally recognized for his innovations in so many of the things that challenge cities. And in, um, in, April, uh, in the April 25th, 2005 issue of Time Magazine, uh, Time said Mayor Daley is widely viewed as the nation's top urban executive and nothing's changed since then. There's so many things that uh, we could talk about in, in an introduction of Mayor Daley, his, the changes he's made in Chicago public schools. He had the courage to take them over 14 years ago. And it's the only large urban school district in America uh, that has made now consistent improvements in, um, in student achievement, which I think is why his um, head of schools is now our Secretary of Education. Um, we can think about the, the very aggressive program that he instituted with public housing in Chicago to change public housing <coughs> to uh, mixed income housing. Uh, again, probably the nation's most aggressive program there, which has made enormous uh, changes in so many neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. And his climate change program, uh, which was called by the New York Times the most sophisticated in this country and maybe uh, the world. But I do want to call to your attention uh, one particular uh, achievement of the mayors, and that is the 
uh, development, the, the inspiration that he had for Millennium Park to turn what was a, a real scar on uh, our city's lakefront. It, that, that is well deserved. I am blessed to live three blocks from it now and, and enjoy it so, so much. But, but uh, to, to take what was this serious scar, nothing but train tracks and parking lot, and turn that into the world's largest green roof and a great park uh, called Millennium Park uh, was, was a magnificent civic statement about the value of public space. And uh, I think that's something that all cities can learn from. He's also uh, become ever more aggressive in uh, outsourcing to private firms a number of city, um, uh, city uh, responsibilities, and that is ending up saving the taxpayers of Chicago $50 million a year and counting. So I can attest to what a pleasure it is to live in a city that is governed by Mayor Daley, so please help me welcome him. And our other guest is Enrique Pinalosa. He is an accomplished public official, economist, and administrator. And now he's a consultant to cities internationally uh, to help make them better. He was the uh, mayor of Bogota, Colombia, and while mayor, uh, made some extraordinary changes and projected that Latin American city, that South American city, to uh, onto a global stage. Um, he, he too made major improvements in his city schools. He actually increased attendance in four years by 34% in his schools, which I think is quite remarkable. But he's perhaps best known for the improvements he made, also like Mayor Daley, to public space and his uh, amazing investments in transportation. And I think in so many ways, uh, both of these men represent innovators in good times and in bad. And I think that's why they have so many lessons to share with us today. So I'm really excited about the ability to, uh, uh, to have this conversation. Mayor Pinalosa is, uh, is writing a book. He says he's finishing a book qualified that finishing a book on the new urban development on, on a new urban development model for the third world but he's author, also authored two previous books uh, one called capitalism the best option and the other called democracy and capitalism challenges of the coming century so please help me welcome mayor enrique pinalosa I want to jump into questions, and Mayor Daly, I'm going to ask you first. Um, an Olympics delegation will arrive in Chicago, I think, next week to evaluate your city's bid for the 2016 Summer Olympics. There, there are many things that the committee will review, but I want to ask you about one in particular. What are the values that you believe a city has to communicate, has to embody today to impress an international delegation? Well, first of all, it's not just the city of Chicago, but the United States of America's bid uh, for the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic. And, and the key person in, in our bid process is truly uh, President Obama. The president will carry the message to Copenhagen uh, this year in regards to the United States of America's bid for Chicago. When the uh, uh, International Olympic Committee comes in to evaluate the city, they're going to be looking at mostly facilities, uh, be looking at uh, the commitment that the city, the state, the federal government has made financial commitments. Uh, the money we're raising is all private. Uh, there won't be any money placed in, in the process uh, from uh, state or um, uh, local governments. There's no burden upon the taxpayers, so we're going to the private sector. At the same time, <clears throat> they will evaluate uh, the environment, uh, how well we plan the different housing for the athletes, uh, how well we plan, how close it is to all the facilities. As you know, the, it's centrally located, the housing downtown, about 15 minutes at the most to about 80, 90 percent of all venues. And they'll be looking at uh, the uh, airports, they'll be looking at uh, the public transportation system and our plans to really uh, change uh, uh, parts of the city in regards to uh, public transportation and the access that people can have into the various facilities. And that's what they're looking at 
uh, in terms of facilities and investments. Are there, are there, is, is there a set of values? You know, do they look to a city or even to the nation as expressing a set of values that are aligned with uh, what they believe are accepted internationally? Well, they want to know what you're really committed uh, to the um, uh, to the Olympic movement and the legacy, what's going to happen afterwards. So we plan to do f three facilities, one on the, the south side, one on the west side, one on the north side, to really train young people to become Olympians. How do you become an Olympian? How do you start training for various sports? And that will be a legacy. Well, after the, the uh, Olympics is there, what happens uh, to the movement? And we have to reassure ourselves that uh, we can educate our young people to become uh, Olympians or Paralympians. That is a legacy in what will be left over in regards to the usage of these facilities. I visited Athens, I visited Beijing, Barcelona, and Barcelona got it years ago. What they did is they transformed their city. The Olympic movement transformed Barcelona. And Barcelona now is an international city. It's a global city. It's recognized because that one event, the Olympic event they had a number of years ago. And even today, they still basically live off that legacy in improvement of the quality of life for their citizens of Barcelona. Have you rethought your, your commitment to the Olympics given I know the hole that's been blown in your budget well, as a no. result of this economy. Well, we're not going to we're, we're not going to commit any money from the city of Chicago and the state from the taxpayers. The federal government, we get the decision made on behalf of the United States and Chicago. The federal government commits themselves to public transportation and infrastructure, and they commit themselves to security. And that's the highest cost of those two, both infrastructure and security, public transportation, roads. Uh, certain type of facilities they can build. They've done that in Atlanta, they've done that uh, in other places uh, where we had the Olympic movement uh, in the United States. Enrique, when you were mayor of, of Bogota, you really managed to project that city onto a global stage. How did you, was that intentional? No, uh, I think uh, most cities that become successful just try to uh, improve the quality of the life of their people. And uh, what does it mean to improve the quality of life of other people beyond the uh, obvious, such as uh, housing or uh, water? And I would say it has a lot to do with this, which has been spoken about. Why Barcelona, for example, as Mayor Daly mentioned, became a big example. Not only has Barcelona lived, but Barcelona was the city that began to change European cities. Uh, from this 20th century city, which was built more for cars than for people, we, I think we've had cities for 5,000 years. For 5,000 years, cities were for people. But the 20th century was a disaster because we really made cities much more for cars, mobility, and for people's well-being. And Barcelona, and uh, I would say, is the first city that began to, to uh, say that we made a mistake. Let's make a city more for people. And they, so this is the types of things that we did. Even in a very poor city where you have many needs, it's, ne it's necessary for people at least to be able to walk safely, to have great sidewalks, to have a great pedestrian promenades, dozens of kilometers, to show respect for human dignity. Every detail in a city should show that people are sacred. And so uh, we need to, if money is scarce, you have to choose. You cannot do everything. So we rather invest in libraries and schools and parks than in big highways, for example. So you have to make difficult choices. Uh, also, when we talk uh, about uh, the greatest challenges of cities, I think transportation is a very peculiar one because uh, transport is a problem that does not get better as you get richer. So I would say it's almost the definition of, of <laughs> yes. I mean, if, if we almost all the problems that we have in developing countries, cities today, if we have three or four times the income per capita, we'll be much better off. We have better health, better education, better housing. But traffic jams will be much worse. So, the, it's, it's, so it's almost a, the definition of non-sustainable. So we also invested a lot in uh, public transport and uh, bicycle ways in uh, I think and our city became a model in the developing world in many ways even has been a model to advance cities for example uh, uh, 
our bus systems have been adopted in advanced cities. Uh, the, we close in Bogota 120 kilometers of main arteries for people to go ride on bicycles and things. And these things have been done in, in several American cities uh, recently too, like New York, or I understand uh, even Portland and others. I think Chicago is also doing. So I think everywhere, uh, a successful city is one that really cares for its citizens, but I would even say more, for its most vulnerable citizens, for children, for the elderly, for the handicapped, for the low-income people. If it's good for them, it will tend to be good for everybody else. One, one thing we learned about uh, going to various cities, you don't build a facility that afterwards, what are you going to use it for? And so we're not going to build anything uh, that we cannot use. And the opening and closing ceremony, uh, facility has to be 80,000. Uh, we already have two uh, baseball uh, facilities, we have a football facility. Uh, that 80,000 uh, facility will be built, but will be only temporary for about uh, 65,000. We'll, we'll tear, tear 65,000 seats out and allow a 15,000 seat stadium near the University of Chicago to be used for lacrosse, football, soccer, other cultural events. And explain what you're going to do with the 65,000 seats you tear out. Well, we're looking at uh, some of the seats to be used at some of the older uh, high school uh, 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 facilities to be used. We're looking at maybe uh, uh, basically recycling them. Uh, it's all going to be environmentally uh, uh, excellent in the sense that we're going to have the, uh, the finest environmental movement in regards to construction and everything in that facility. All the facilities that we build are modernized. You, you've brought up the, uh, uh, the environmental uh, sensitivity that you have. I, I think clearly you were one of the first mayors who began to, rec in the U.S., who began to recognize the, the sustainability movement, put the green roof on City Hall. That was, you know, for which you, you got a lot of attention. Enrique, you invested in transit, and I mean, from basically the ground up. I'm sort of curious, what was, if you, each of you would tell us, what was your first impulse that, you know, the sustainability thing was important and Chicago could be, Chicago, the city of big shoulders, could in fact be a green city. What, what was that first impulse and for you also, Enrique, in terms of the first impulse on what made you think public transit was a way to go? Mayor Daley first. Well, I think living in a city all my life and, and coming to live a few blocks in the stockyards, heavy manufacturing, things like that. But I always believe that nature can coexist in a city. You don't have to travel someplace to enjoy the environment and we have a responsibility uh, in a city li like ours to change the course of history in regards to uh, what took place many years ago. What took place many years ago, maybe look, you look down upon it, but it really rebuilt uh, America and rebuilt families and built the middle class and some of the difficulties we see today uh, we're looking at. But I've always believed that nature can coexist. Uh, you can really enjoy the lakefront, the parks, the beaches, uh, open space, uh, buildings to be constructed in an environmentally way uh, that people want to go to work, environmentally friendly inside, that the air is clean outside, and, and that uh, the city can coexist with nature. And so that's why we plant more and more trees. We have nature centers. We're looking at our parks uh, to have uh, nature areas in almost all of our parks. We have big bird sanctuaries within the city because they fly along, along the lake and the river coming from Canada all the way down. And, and so I really believe that uh, all of our schools now have uh, uh, conservation clubs. Uh, we tore all the asphalt out. We tell the community, you take pride in it. That's yours. You have responsibility. The idea of government doing everything, I'm, you know, I, I believe that people have more responsibility than government. We can lead, but it's your responsibility. Individual responsibility in the United States should be much stronger than government telling you what to do every day. And that's why you really have to educate the people about the environment. You're not going to scare people anymore. You need, I don't care what people do, you're not going to scare them. You have to educate them first. If you educate them about the issue, they'll understand it. If you try to do scare tactics, it never works. It never works at all. Did you have an idea that the green roof on City Hall sure. would become such a media phenomenon? Oh, I, I think that's, uh, when you look out our beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful lakefront and uh, beautiful high rises, skyscrapers, which I truly believe in because skyscrapers save beautiful farmland. We destroy more farmland in America than any other place. Look at the rest of the world destroying good land skyscrapers save. If you build them environmentally friendly inside, outside, 
they will save. An example, we're retrofitting, it used to be the Sears building, now it's the Willis building in Chicago. <laughs> we want you to work on that. No, I like it, Willis. They, they should have responsibility. They, they have a big financial stake in it. Uh, and uh, so that's going to be retrofitted. Uh, and so what we're retrofitting, many of the older buildings downtown uh, through the help of uh, uh, special tax districts uh, in the downtown area. Otherwise, all these buildings that you see historically will be demolished because they, there's no use for them at all. And that's what they're finding out. So we're going to retrofit them and we're going to help the landlords, uh, the owners of the property, then bring back basically tenants into those facilities. Enrique, first impulse. Well, I'll tell you that I always uh, worried very much about the environment, but my concern was more people. We must remember that people are part of the environment. Uh, I love trees, for example, my mother had a nursery always, uh, and she designed gardens, so I, I knew more about trees than uh, the people in charge of trees in the city. So, <laughs> because I grew up with this, uh, so I, we made a huge investment in planting trees and all this, but we must remember that the city is an environment for people. I see in many places there is conflict. Sometimes even the radical environmentalists don't want to let a bicycle way put uh, next uh, near a waterfront because they say it's bad for something, but they forget that children are also uh, important. So what, what I find fascinating is that we try to do a city great for people and then it became an environmental model. For example, we built bicycle ways because they are important for mobility, and we, we build like from zero to almost uh, 300 miles of protected, physically protected bicycle ways. We increase ridership from zero to 5%, which is in our 7 million inhabitant city, 350,000 people riding bicycles every day. It's amazing. Uh, and uh, but this is also for us a matter of equity. We were trying to show that a citizen on a $30 bicycle is equally important to one on a $30,000 car, or a child in a bicycle is, is equally important. Uh, and then it turns out that it's also important. Uh, access to green, I think, is crucial. I think this is a need that we have to parks, to sports facilities. I would say maybe this is the, in the future, it will be the main element of inclusion or exclusion, to be able to have access to green. In public pedestrian space is the only place where we all meet as equals. And uh, in the future, the low-income people will have uh, iPods and computers and everything, but they will not have access to green unless we do something about it. And we need all children to be able to have access to green without being members of a country club. Uh, and so uh, I think it's crucial to buy, I mean, even in very low income societies, uh, parks are as important as hospitals. This is not some kind of luxury that we, we, we do if we have money left over. I like to show in many places all over the world, like for example, Central Park, which was made in 1860, when New York was much poorer than almost practically any developing country city today. And still they had the vision to create this. So we may invest it a lot in parks. And transport, transport clearly, I think, if we look to the future, cars, even if they were electric cars, totally non-polluting, non-energy consuming cars, they it's, this do a lot of damage to the quality of life of a city because they, they kill people, they are, they are dangerous, so we, meet, we have, there is a conflict for this very scarce space uh, between cars and people. A, a city that is very friendly to fast cars is not very friendly in a very people environment. So we, we had clari clarity that we had to promote public transport. And I think the only, pos I mean, what is good public transport? One that is, gets people close to the origin and destination of their trips that goes near where they start and where they go, and one that is fast. And, the, and this is uh, something interesting because in the U.S. now, with the crisis, people are very much in love with trams. Uh, and I think trams is a very sexy thing now, but it's very rational investment. It's a, it's a, you can do exactly the same thing with buses at a fraction of the investment cost and at a fraction of the operational cost if you have exclusive busways. Uh, actually, you know, in 1935, all cities with more than 100,000 inhabitants had trams. And when buses appeared, trams disappeared because at that time it was buses that were sexy. And they were more efficient. <laughs> yeah, trams were crowded and they were... So i just like to say that, uh, for example, London has more than 1,000 miles of rail. Uh, 
between subway and uh, suburban uh, rail, and they still move one million more passengers per bus than by rail. And the cost of the, of the subway is huge. It can cost up to $14 a ticket. Or, and the average ticket in the London subway is about six, seven dollars. And these, the subsidies, the annual subsidies to, to public transport in London is more than $12 billion a year. So uh, with our bus system that we created with exclusive busways, which I think uh, it moves more than 95, per, moves more people per kilometer than 95% of rail systems in the world and subway systems. Uh, it's uh, faster than uh, subways, than most subways when we don't have traffic lights. So I think it's these times of scarcity, of scarcity, if we, in, uh, where everybody in the United States is thinking of uh, how to create more density, I think more density will mean turning many uh, inner suburbs into higher rise buildings, not necessarily 20 story high, but, uh, and this, they will need quality public transport close to the origin and close to the destination. And the only way to achieve this is with great bus systems. One thing about the environment is that I always think government should lead by example and not to mandate and tell the business community to come in. So what we did is we talked to the business community and I said the city's going to lead the way. Why should I mandate you and the city's exempted from all the environmental changes we made? So we build uh, whether it's a fire, police station, library, schools, environmentally friendly. And then in turn, we help the business community to adapt and change uh, some of the facilities they have. And also we have a green permit system. This idea of mandating and telling everybody what to do, it's like the federal government. They tell you what to do and they don't follow their own advice. <laughs> and so that's what happens continually uh, on majority of things they send out of Washington, D.C. And so uh, local government has to lead by example in the environmental movement. Uh, we have a water conservation program. We're putting more rain barrels in. And when you look out of the beautiful uh, skyline that we have and you're up on the top of a building, all those flat roofs will be uh, green roofs. Uh, they help the environment. Uh, they capture rainwater. Uh, example, McCormick Place, the largest convention uh, uh, facility in the world. We capture over 55 million uh, uh, gallons of rainwater a year. That automatically goes into the uh, Lake Michigan. And so we're building our roads, everything, to think about water conservation. That is one issue that I think it should be on the agenda of both state and federal governments. Uh, uh, even though in the Great Lakes we have all the water we, we need, but we have to really conserve that. And so that you really have to lead by example. And if you don't, then I think people then shy away from the environmental movement. There's always an exemption for government. And to me, government should be leading the way. You, you said a minute ago, Mayor, uh, that you can't scare people into action. And, and I know and now you're talking about the uh, leading by example. You're also talking about incentivizing the, the action you want, particularly by business with your green permitting, as an example. Um, I, I'm curious, I mean, in, in both of your cases, it's, it's not easy to sell taxpayers on public investment. I mean, they're, I mean, it's always hard to sell people on the idea that they need to pay more for government and for public facilities. How do you do it? Well, you have to be careful because there's a lot of waste and inefficiency and corruption in government. There is. I mean, that's both in the public and private sector. So you have to think outside the box. So we start leasing public assets. We took our garages. You start looking at government. Why are we in these businesses? We know nothing about garages. So <laughs> why don't we go to the private sector? and start outsourcing. So we outsourced, we have a, we had a, a Skyway, it was a toll road, uh, we leased that for about $1.5 billion. Uh, we leased our garages, uh, 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 parking meters, uh, things like that. We should get out of the business. What is government doing in all these businesses? The private sector can manage much better uh, than government. I firmly believe that. And so that we start outsourcing. And so we start leasing assets and if the, if Every city, county, state, and the federal government start leasing assets. You would have more money for infrastructure, wouldn't increase one tax, you'll never have to go into debt. But again, you have to think outside the box, but government stays within the box. They can't look outside the box, and that's why CEOs for cities are so important that you're bringing people in from the private sector, uh, talking about issues in a completely different way, not in a governmental way, 
but more from the citizens' way of looking at issues. And I think the problem with government, you become too insular, too bureaucratic, uh, too many laws, rules, and regulations. You build bureaucracy in each department. One department doesn't talk to the other. Uh, right. it, we, you can see that in Washington, D.C. No one knows anything about AIG, but someone knew about it, but they can't find the person who did it. But <laughs> welcome to, doesn't matter if Democrats or Republicans, I just want to tell you that, that's how government is in Washington, D.C. Uh, so, so my viewpoint is you have to think outside the box, especially today in our financial conditions where you can't keep taxing people. You can't tell people you have to pay more and more where government has to live within a budget. Uh, the federal government doesn't have to live with a budget. They can, you know, they're spending, they're going to spend as much as they want because they can print money. But you have to balance your budget. So last year, we have a four-year budget we're looking at, uh, uh, 09, 10, 11, and 12. And so we have a rainy day fund of two, three hundred million dollars. But we're cutting back employees, we're laying off employees, uh, uh, we're cutting back overtime expenditures, uh, we're not hiring people. Everybody says, hire more fire and police. Yeah, sure. But how are you going to pay for it? If people are getting laid off, if they're a foreclosure, you just can't live uh, in a way that uh, you're going to live in, in the future by uh, basically going in debt. But and cities can't go in debt. Only the federal government goes in debt. Well, where's the t where where is the tipping point, though? Is there is there well, some place where you fear we cut back too much and then the city becomes not clean or or no. or unsafe or? City's clean is up to the people. It's not just up to government to clean the city. It's up to people to take responsibility. It's up to people. We have block clubs, community organizations, churches, businesses. It isn't the city to 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, community policing is important. Isn't the police going to solve uh, a crime? It's the community that's going to solve crime. You, you have to basically empower communities to take responsibility. They can't believe that government's going to do everything for them. You can only do so much. It's like education. If a parent or parents are not involved with their children's education, you can only do so much because you only have them in for 30 or 35 hours a week. It's really up to people taking responsibility. And that's one thing we've done. Uh, we have a lot of block clubs, community organizations, and telling people you can clean your own block. You, you, can, you can do things for your own community, your own block. It isn't up to government constantly. And I think that's what the problem, I think, in America. Everybody's looking to government to solve all these issues. And I tell you, don't look towards the government to solve these issues, because how did we get into this thing? <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's, that's very realistic. Uh, you know, it's just uh, like the post office. I mean, they had the, I don't know if it's a fully private company or it's partial, but uh, I think there's, a long way to go uh, in regards to um, giving people responsibility and, and letting them take the responsibility more so than government. Enrique, how did you sell increased taxes, uh, increased expenditures for public amenities? Uh, well, I agree with Mayor Daly that you should subcontract everything that's possible with the private sector because that will be more efficient less subject to political inefficiencies of all kinds. We did some interest, our, for example, our bus system is a system that operates maybe 60 public employees, everything is subcontracted with the private sector, the people who have really? the electronic tickets, the buses are private, everything. Um, we did even a very interesting experiment with schools. We did some fantastically beautiful schools in the poorest areas of the city. And of course, as in all underdeveloped countries, the best schools are those where the upper income uh, children go, the private schools. So we got the best private schools in the country to manage some of the public schools in the poorest neighborhoods of the city, and that was greatly successful. Uh, and, uh, but I also think that um, some things government provide most things, government provides many things which are not very pleasant to write because they're a means. They don't provide really happiness to provide roads or uh, sewage or, but some things the government provides are an end in itself. I mean, mainly parks. I think public space is a magical good. If you go buy something in the shop, a shirt or a toy or anything, it will make you very happy the first time you buy it. Six months later, much less, and two, two or three years later, you don't know what to do with it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, but if you have a park in front of your house or a great public space, it will yield 
pleasure. It will give happiness one day, uh, two days, one year, two years, 20 years, 50 years. It's like a magical good, which never wears out its capacity to provide happiness. So I think uh, uh, sometimes public consumption or consumption of public goods can yield more happiness than consumption of private goods. For example, I think most people would agree that to have a nice park next to their homes or near their homes will give them more happiness than to buy an extra jacket or an extra toy every year. So this has very practical and interesting implication. This means that, for example, to charge people more taxes so they will have one jacket less, or they will change the car less often, but they will have a better park, will give them more pleasure, more satisfaction. So if you are able to achieve this, we were able to, to come to a point, let me tell you this interesting uh, situation, where people were so happy with what was happening that uh, the mayor asked the people to pay extra tax, 10% extra tax, voluntary. The mayor, I mean, just after, we did not have re-election, it's only one term, so, but two months after I left, the, the person who I supported asked the people to pay 10% extra tax voluntarily. And there were more than 80,000 people and companies that paid 10% extra tax. I mean, that gave money to government uh, as if it was an NGO or something. Uh, uh, so this shows uh, that, uh, Sometimes, I mean, the government can also make life much more fun for people. Uh, uh, if you have cultural activities, if you have great public spaces, if you have great parks, uh, sometimes consumption of public goods, I insist, it will give you more pleasure than consumption of private goods. So people are very willing to pay more if they see that lives are really improving. Have you considered outsourcing? to a private firm, the operation of Chicago Transit, Transit Authority? Well, I, th I think first of all, the Transit Authority has to be clean, safe, on time, and friendly. And uh, uh, we outsource many of the things there, uh, engineering, uh, marketing, things like that. Uh, you have the operating uh, side of it, uh, dealing with the bus operators and all that. Uh, but again, uh, public uh, transportation is always short fund in the United States because we've just done that. There's only a few cities that really look at public transportation, maybe San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Boston, Philadelphia. There aren't many cities that really look at one of the key elements uh, of their growth in the future of their city is through public transportation. So in Chicago, we're fortunate to have the Chicago Transit Authority that serves uh, about 50 suburban areas and you have the metro going out into the collar counties. So it's a, it's a good system and it's working very well, but again, uh, it's always short change in, in regards to Washington, D.C.'s assessment that roads and bridges are mo more important than public transportation. And uh, so that's what you have to work through in a political way. Mayor, you, uh, I mean, you know the president very well. You, you watched him grow up uh, in, in Chicago politically. I, I'm curious, what do you expect from this administration for cities? Well, I think a, a better understanding, not for a city, uh, it's for the metropolitan area. You know, it's a six county area uh, Chicago has, and it's about 75% of the uh, population in Illinois. So it's not just for Chicago, it's a metropolitan area you have to look at. And we have to really come, we're an urban community, we're not a rural community anymore. And we, we a lot of people have moved out of cities, the bigger cities, say, well, I live in a suburban area, I feel like I live in a rural area, but it's not because they have the same problems in education, taxes, the same problems with parks, open space, they have the same problems with crime in a lesser degree. And, and so all the issues they're confronting with are urban. And so we want not only the White House, but you want the federal government to think about an urban plan. So it just can't be the White House. You have so many various departments to think that these are huge urban communities. Say you take uh, Fayetteville, uh, North Carolina, uh, Fort Bragg, that's a huge urban community. It's not a rural community, it's an urban community. So we have to rethink uh, what Washington is doing, but I'd be very, very frank, very hard, very hard to have Washington, D.C. ever rethink about an issue. Uh, <laughs> But I believe that President Obama understands it. Uh, he, he, many people who have come with his administration understand education, housing, economic development, understands parks, open space. Uh, 
he has a good appreciation of urban communities, uh, understanding how important education, higher universities are, medical institutions, research and development. So th they're the nucleus of the White House, and at the same time, how do they affect these various departments? Mm -hmm. And I think you have a good agenda. It's, it's getting there. It's harder and harder because you have you have to deal with the Congress continually in regards to any appropriations. So like anything else, they have their individual priorities, or collectively, they maybe look at issues differently in regards to urban issues. I, I want to ask both of you. I, I know that the things you try to do are hard. Even the basic things you try to do are hard. And then when you try to innovate and think outside the box, I mean, the parking meter situation in Chicago, you know, the, it's on the front page and people are, eh, you don't care. Uh, but but I'm, I'm sort of curious, what do you need from business and universities what do you need from uh, from business community and universities well, first to of all, support we, we have the, one agenda. Of the, best, the finest business communities in, in the country in the world uh, I mean they, they they're up to the plate on education reform they're there we not only have uh, public schools we have charter schools contract schools you have to have competition for public schools we have a great higher university system because you have public and private there's competition but the problem in elementary and high school you don't have competition and that's why you have charter contract schools. I have unusual powers on that uh, in taking over because I can close schools down. It's like a trustee in bankruptcy. I hate to say that. Uh, but it's a trustee in bank bankruptcy, appointing uh, the board of directors, uh, looking at, you know, schools have failed for 20, 30 years. And people just sit back and just say, I guess that's how it should be. And uh, you can close. We close failing schools. Uh, we fire the principal, teacher. Uh, we're hiring competent teachers, we're reviewing the status of principals, and the business community has come forward on this. And whether it's Millennium Park who contributed $250 million, and we contribute $250 million to build that park, whether it's economic development, whether it's the expansion uh, of uh, O'Hare Field, or re renovation of Midway Airport, whether it's bringing new business communities when they come in to meet the mayor, uh, have them working on issues for us. Uh, I ask them to look at the operation uh, of, of uh, the police department in regards to technology, in regards to building new police stations. We build new police stations, the use of technology. Uh, we have more cameras than any other city. We're doing a pilot program for three communities cameras and uh, maybe eight, 12 blocks in every alley and every uh, street to really see how what a camera can do is to prevent crime. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a you have to really bring in the private sector. And I am fortunate to call upon the private sector continually. They don't get into partisan politics. They're not looking at Democrats or Republicans or what's happening in Washington or a state capitol. They want to give back to the city. And to me, that's vitally important. Universities are the key. In the 60s, um, uh, my father was mayor for 20 years from 1955 to 1976. Uh, and he said when he was a young man in, in Springfield, he wanted a campus for University of Illinois, Chicago campus. It was the most difficult decision he made because he was basically displacing many Democrats who voted for him over a number of years on the near west side of the city of Chicago. But my father said that this university is going to give their children or grandchildren and future immigrant children an opportunity to go to a wonderful university in the city of Chicago under the University of Illinois. And building that today, you go on the west side, the research, the development, the housing, the student dorms, the restaurants, yeah. it's really changed part of the city of Chicago. But at that time, all the mayors were shying away from the expansion of medical centers, universities. Medical centers and universities are the key to a city of Chicago, and I'm very pro-university and pro-medical uh, centers in regards to their expansion, what they want to do for our city and, and the image of our city. And so that uh, you have to be able to uh, uh, make some difficult decisions, and you, you accept criticism, but you can't just uh, all of a sudden stop what you're doing if you believe and you're passionate about it, you really believe uh, that this decision is, is worth staying strong on it, even though there's a lot of criticism. In the business community, uh, many times uh, when I closed Miggs Field, it was a small <laughs> field in the city of Chicago, right along the lakefront, uh, people don't realize that it was going to cost the city $4 million to manage it. It was a losing proposition. If you're in business, 
losing proposition, you don't stay with it. And so what we did is I closed it uh, under federal and state law. Uh, I followed off federal, state, and local law on that decision and made open space on it. And now if I didn't do that, the Olympics would not be looking for Chicago if that site was, uh, could not be used for the Olympic movement. So sometimes you have to take some difficult and challenging criticism, but in the long run, uh, you have to stay your course, you have to stay focused, and you have to believe what you're doing is changing the quality of life for your citizens. En Enrique, you consult with cities internationally. What are the, are, are they looking to their business communities for some support, some help, uh, partnerships, what are they looking for? I would say that uh, in the developing world, I mean, everywhere there is some sort of conflicts between uh, uh, different groups in society. And the, the difficult thing for mayors is, uh, I have always given this example of this airport that Mayor Daly closed in the, because, uh, <laughs> because great people who have managed great cities have had, had to, to I mean, I would say the essence of democracy is not just that the people go vote. The essence of democracy is that the first article in the Constitution that said all citizens are equal before the law, and a consequence of that which says that public good prevails over private interest. Mm -hmm. So this is not just theory. It's not poetry. It's some very practical implications, such as turning this airport for a, a high, very high income people into a public park. But once you try to do it, it's very, very difficult. And there is always great conflict. There is, it's not the class conflict that Marx talked about between three billionaires and the rest of society normally. But, but for example, they had a big conflict also turning the most exclusive country club in Bogota, uh, trying to turn it into a public park, a golf club. Uh, and uh, at least we were able to turn the polo fields into a public park to begin with and uh, to, to get the process going. I had a war just getting uh, cars, th tens of thousands of cars out of uh, the sidewalks where they used to park parking bays to make wider sidewalks. So the conflict to take uh, some lanes in the streets from cars just to give them to uh, busways so that buses can go much faster than cars. Uh, so all of these conflicts, uh, the business community will, has to have a, a, a more a generous attitude and to, and, to, and to really, we have to build a shared vision of what society uh, should be like because some uh, painful decisions are necessary, uh, either to charge more taxes on time. For example, I think uh, almost anybody would agree that uh, towards the future we need much better public transport. This will have a cost. How should this be financed? To me, it's very obvious, as it's begun to be done in many cities in the world, that it's cars which create enormous costs to society, environmental costs, quality of life costs, all this, that most of the funds to improve public transport and to subsidize public transport should come out of taxes on car use. So I think, for example, gasoline taxes should be much more expensive in order to subsidize better public transport. So in this type of difficult decisions is that the private sector should be understanding because the private sector tends to be very short-sighted sometimes. You know, they look in the very short run, but so I think in the, once we begin to, we, we are able to construct a shared vision of a longer run, uh, we begin that, uh, to agree that it's necessary to make some sacrifices. All changes are difficult. Always changes is very is painful. It's always difficult to change, but we must agree that what we are getting at will be a better way of living, not just more environmental, but happier, better, more fun, with more jobs. And uh, but to get there, normally, is painful, and so that's when you need uh, the private sector. Normally, people in government tend to be more understanding and uh, and uh, about the needs of the poor, for example. Uh, or the equity considerations. And this is where I think uh, uh, for all these difficult decisions, that's where we need a, a, a great alliance between private and public sector. 
But you have to allow the business community to, to be welcome into the city and very pro-business. I want more North American headquarters. I want to be able to work with business. And when, when we move from uh, Seattle to Chicago, I welcome them. The business community did. Uh, they hired people. They're very involved in the city. You have to have businesses in the city in order to hire people from your public education system or in order to hire uh, younger people who have graduated from graduate schools uh, across the country. So you have to bring the business. If, if you're uh, if you're not going to welcome the business community into your city, I think they will locate any place, not just in the United States, but throughout the world now. I mean, they can move to Toronto. They can go to uh, Dublin. They can go to London. They can move easily in regards to their locations or their headquarters or their subsidiaries. And I think America has to come to grips with that. I know we're all down because we're blaming business for all the issues, all the issues now in regards to the financial arrangements. But you know, government has responsibility too, and they failed as well. So let's not, let's not constantly beat up the business community because I need the business community to locate, relocate, expand their operations in the city of Chicago. We have only a minute left. Uh, just a quick answer. What are mayors not paying enough attention to today? Education. That was quick. Enrique? <laughs> well, I think that uh, equity considerations are important. Many people think that as communism collapsed, we can't forget about the equality issue. Uh, and, uh, but we have, for 2,000 years, the West, I would say, was born out of a s s s worry with equality. Since Greece, Rome, Judeo-Christian philosophy, the most uh, co social conflicts and revolution over the last 300 years. Uh, so clearly, we are not going to have income equality. But there are still many other issues related to, to social justice, which are uh, very much necessary to keep present. And probably education underpins that's very that, related, that certainly. Very <laughs> right. I said that if you can fix the education system, uh, uh, early childhood, uh, good quality, elementary and high school, and make ed education the highest priority in America, opportunities to go on to college and uh, higher ed, uh, this would transform America. But if you start getting on tangents, you fail another generation of young people. And America is failing in regards to math, science, technology, basic things that that I see as, as mayor that all the social ills comes from lack of education. We're here, all of us are well educated. Uh, people can't be here because they're not well educated. Right. And that's a sad problem in the United States and no one's focusing on it as yet. Well, let's hope, uh, let's hope the new administration will give you some help in focusing on oh, it. I hope so. <laughs> I'm going to be positive. I think I'm going to end will. on a positive note. I think note. they will with uh, Secretary uh, Arne Duncan, who understands that uh, education is the future of yeah. this country in a global society. You, you trained him well. Thank you, Rico.